Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Tom Lendy. I direct the McFarland Center for Religion, Ethics, and Culture, and I'm pleased to invite you uh, to welcome you tonight to one of the college's uh, programs in the Kraft Hyatt Program for Jewish Christian Understanding. Uh, one of our lecture series, uh, this one, is committed to understanding and deepening the understanding of Judaism, Jewish-Christian relations, and Jew Jewish life around the world. In addition to lectures, the Kraft Hyatt Fund sends faculty to study the Holocaust at Yad Vashem and provides opportunity for students to attend the Summer Institute of Hebrew University in Jerusalem. I just heard at dinner that we don't advertise that well enough, I was told, so that I should tell students more that we do have a program that we can send students and pay for them to study at Hebrew University in the summer in Jerusalem. We've got some good takers this year, but it's a good idea in the future to think of. So I'll, that'll, I'll put that plug in. Uh, you can learn more about our programs, and you can watch a recording of tonight's talk and others in this series and others at holycross.edu slash McFarland Center. Tonight's lecture is on Israel's security in a changing Middle East, and it's certainly timely. Just this week, as you probably know, President Obama visited Israel, his first presidential trip there. He reaffirmed his commitment to Prime Minister Netanyahu to help prevent Iran, Iran from getting nuclear weapons. So we're really pleased tonight to uh, welcome Yaakov Katz to break down Israel's secu security situation for us and tell us about that threat from Iran and, uh, and Israel's response. Yaakov Katz is military correspondent and defense analyst for the Jerusalem Post and the Israel correspondent for Jane's Defense Weekly, the international military magazine. He has covered Israeli military operations over the past decade, including the pullout from the Gaza Strip in 2005, the Second Lebanon War in 2006, and the Operation Cast Lead in Gaza in 2009. His first book, Israel versus Iran, The Shadow War, which is available for sale outside and for signing, uh, became a national bestseller in Israel in 2011, it was published here in the United States in May of 2012. Currently, Yaakov is serving as a Neiman Fellow at Harvard University, where he's studying the use of censorship in the digital age, particularly in coverage of Israel and the Middle East. Originally from Chicago, he moved to Israel in 1993. He served in the Israeli Defense Force Armor Corps and earned a law degree from Bar Ilan University. He lives in Jerusalem, well, now he lives in Brookline, but usually he lives in Jerusalem. Uh, with his wife and four children. So please join me in welcoming Yaakov Katz. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's really an uh, honor to be here. I appreciate the invitation. And um, there's no question that we live in, there's the, you know, the famous Chinese curse. May you live in interesting times. And there's no question that Israel um, is, is blessed to some extent with that curse, that the times are always interesting. And I'd like to start with a, just to share with you an experience I had a few months ago before I came here over the summer to begin my fellowship. So as a journalist who covers the military in Israel, we often have the opportunity to kind of be that fly on the wall as the chief of staff or some general or defense minister travels, goes to participate in a military exercise or gives a briefing of sorts. And there was this one day that the IDF, the Israel Defense Forces chief of staff, was going from his office in Tel Aviv to visit Israeli military forces deployed along the Palestinian city of Nablus in the West Bank. Nablus is one of the larger Palestinian cities with a population of about 100, 150,000 people and in that larger Nablus metropolitan area. And Israeli forces surround the area because once upon a time, not too long ago, back in the earlier part of the decade of the 2000s, 2002, 3, 4, when the second intifada, when the Palestinian terrorist campaign was at its height, many of the suicide bombers that were blowing up in cafes and buses, in restaurants throughout Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, and other parts of Israel originated inside Nablus. And as he was there, we went to different briefings with intelligence officers to kind of learn about the state of terrorism today inside the city, which is very good to hear at an all-time low, to hear a little about the economy, to speak with some of the other officers, to meet with some of the civilian leaders, even on the Palestinian side. And what struck me was that after five, six hours of meetings and briefings, we get back into his armored jeep, start heading back towards Tel Aviv. And as we pull out of one of the bases nearby where we had spent most of the day, 
General Benny Gantz, that's the IDF Chief of Staff, he was actually the, U the Israeli military attache here in Washington, D.C. just a few years ago, orders his driver, says pull over to the side of the road. He pulls out his cell phone and he calls up the Israeli regional brigade commander, the guy, this colonel who's in charge of the entire area, and says to him, Nimrod, my car has just been hit by an IED, an improvised explosive device. One of my soldiers has been abducted. Get here. And he slams the phone shut. And I'm sitting there in the Jeep watching him, and I say to myself, you know, this is obviously not true, right? This is part of a surprise drill that he's just decided to, to enact and start. And I said to him, General Gantz, you know, with all due respect, you're the chief of staff. You've been with Nimrod, this brigade commander, all day. You can imagine that when the top guy comes, your top boss, you're under a lot of pressure. You want everything to run smoothly. And now, after finally the day's over, this is what you're doing to him? And it, you see within minutes, soldiers from all over scramble, come from the hill. You have drones up in the air. You got armored personnel carriers running down the different roads, all searching for this imaginative Israeli soldier who's been abducted by Palestinian terrorists. But General Gantz goes on to explain to me as he says, Yaakov, in today's strategic situation for Israel, in the security challenges that we face, what I want to try to impress upon the military and impress upon my subordinates and these units is that a conflict can erupt within a moment's notice that we might not even see coming. And that's what we have to prepare for. And I think that this theme, this idea, this concept is so important today for Israel. Because when you look around and you look at Israel today, and I know some, I had dinner with some students who are going to be spending the summer in Jerusalem. The Israel's security situation in one word is something of a paradox. On the one hand, you have unprecedented security. 2012, for example, was the first year since 1973, right, 39, 40 years ago, almost, that we haven't had a suicide, uh, sorry, not a suicide, we haven't had an Israeli killed in the West Bank in a terrorist attack. So that means for 40 years, Israelis have been killed in terrorist attacks in the West Bank. This is the first year that we didn't have an Israeli casualty. The, the sites of security guards at the entrances to coffee shops, to restaurants, at buses, it's no longer the case. The thousand Israelis who lost their lives in terrorist attacks during the Second Intifada, which ran largely from 2000 to about 2004, 2005, are history. The days of when suicide bombers were blowing up, like the one in the Park Hotel, Passover, the Jewish holiday of Passover, is starting this Monday night when Jews around the world sit down for the traditional festive meal called the Seder to commemorate the Jewish exodus many, many years ago from Egypt. So back in 2002, when a group of Jews were gathering at the Park Hotel in the seaside city of Netanya, a suicide bomber, a Palestinian from a city called Tul Karim, disguised as a woman, walked into the hotel, blew himself up, and killed 30 Israelis, then, which embarked and prompted the government to embark on an operation called Defensive Shield and reconquer the entire West Bank. Those days are, thankfully, seem to be history for the moment. But what I want to tell you is that if you look just now, just a few weeks ago, we saw another example of how, on the one hand, yes, there's security in Israel, and the situation is very good, but we're, on a, we're in a position that one move, a small conflict, a small gunfight can erupt into something much larger. An example of this was just a few weeks ago when Israeli Air Force fighter jets infiltrated into Syria and bombed and destroyed a key Syrian chemical weapons production plant, as well as the number of trucks that apparently were carrying SA-17 surface-to-air missiles. These are very sophisticated Russian-made surface-to-air missile systems. They were, have a range of about 30, 40 kilometers. They can fly at altitudes of about 40,000 feet. They can simultaneously target a number of different aircraft that are flying within range of the areas that they cover. These Missiles Israel feared were being put on these trucks at a base not far from the Syrian-Lebanese border to be transferred to the Hezbollah terrorist guerrilla organization backed by Iran, which operates inside Lebanon. And Israel has said that it would not allow weapons that are possible game changers in the sense that they could create a new balance of power in the region and impair Israel's ability to 
operate freely and to fly over Lebanon if needed, it would prevent the, those, those weapons transfers. And Israel did with that strike. But there was no guarantee when Israel bombed that facility and those trucks that there would be no response by Assad. Assad, Bashar al-Assad, the leader of Syria, currently this week is the anniversary, two-year anniversary to the beginning of the uprising, the civil war in Syria, which has claimed already the lives of, according to United Nations estimates, 70 to 80,000 innocent people. But there was no guarantee that Assad would not respond. But Israel's calculation was that so preoccupied with the ongoing fighting inside Syria, he would not have the ability to divert his forces and attention to begin to retaliate against Israel. But these types of challenges are not limited just to the front with Syria. While the border with Egypt today is somewhat secure, Israel has erected now a five meter fence, double layered barbed wire with 40 to 50 towers along this 240 kilometer border. That's about, let's say, 100 miles or so, one of Israel's longest borders. With towers, each tower has these special electro-optic cameras that can see deep inside the Sinai Peninsula into Egypt, has radar so they can detect potential intruders, not when they get to the border, but when they're miles away from the border so they can scramble troops to get to the border. And why are they doing this? Is because we've had several infiltrations from Egypt of terrorists that have crossed into Israel. Now remember, Egypt's a country Israel has peace with, right? 1979, Camp David Accords. Israel pulled out of the Sinai Peninsula, gave it all back after it had conquered in 1967. But Israel's facing a growing terrorist threat in Egypt from the Sinai, crossing into Israel. Rockets have been fired from the Sinai, from Egypt into Israel. And that potential exists now with Syria. And for that reason, Israel is going to begin erecting a fence and has already begun on the, front, on the border with Syria. And the same to do with Jordan. But as President Obama said today in his speech to college students in Jerusalem, which, by the way, was a fantastic speech. I recommend you all watch it. Really, President, President Obama at his best. No fence is large enough or can be tall enough to prevent all threats. And there's a lot that Israel needs to do beyond just building fences. But what I want to talk about today is, which the title of my talk is Israel's Security in the Changing Middle East, is that if you look at Israel's concerns, I think they can be split primarily into three different categories. The first category is on a very basic tactical level, similar to what I was just talking about. You have a terrorist in the Sinai, a terrorist in southern Syria, or a terrorist along the border with Egypt, or even in the West Bank, and we know of Hamas in the Gaza Strip, for example. Just this past November was an eight-day operation called Pillar of Defense that the Israel Defense Forces, the IDF, waged against Hamas to stop rocket fire. That's all on a very basic tactical level. So you can build fences, you can deploy forces to patrol your borders, you can conduct counter-terror operations. We've spoken about that and the steps that Israel's doing to bolster its defenses, similar to, let's say, the Iron Dome counter-rocket defense system, which is a one-of-a-kind system in the world, missile defense, that can intercept short-range rockets. It did very, was very successful in the last large round of violence back in November, which is also uh, funded largely by the United States government. But if we put the tactical level aside for a moment, I think the second concern, which is slightly greater, is what I like to call the military buildup in the region. And to give you an example of what I'm referring to, let's zoom in for a moment on Hezbollah. Hezbollah, a Iranian Shiite backed group inside Lebanon, which has been fighting with Israel for decades now. Israel until 19, from 1982 when Israel invaded Lebanon in an effort to stop the Palestinian Liberation Organization, the PLO, Palestinian terrorists, from attacking northern Israel. Then carved out what was called the security zone in southern Lebanon and maintained a presence there until 2000 when it withdrew from Lebanon. But Hezbollah, then, it was then it was PLO, then Hezbollah became the primary adversary or enemy of Israel inside Lebanon. And just five months after Israel withdrew from Lebanon in May of 2000, in October of 2003, Israeli soldiers were abducted by Hezbollah. Their bodies were only returned in January of 2004. But over the years, there have been skirmishes along the border, rocket attacks along the border. But come 2006, July 12th of 2006, and Hezbollah guerrillas invade Israel and abduct two Israeli reservists who were on a patrol along the border. 
take their bodies for many years, for two years. Israel did not know if they were alive, dead. And their bodies were returned in 2008. But that attack sparked what became known as the Second Lebanon War. A war that lasted, Israel's longest war, lasted for 34 days. But what happened in that war, Hezbollah fired 4,000 rockets into northern Israel. But I want to tell you is that since that war in 2006, what we've seen is an unprecedented buildup on Hezbollah's part in the capabilities that it now has. And in military intelligence in Israel, they actually refer to this by the name of fire by six, fire referring to rockets, with the six changes that have taken place. The first change, the most dramatic one possibly, is in the quantity. If back in 2006, in the last war that Israel fought against Hezbollah, Hezbollah had 15,000 rockets, they fired 4,000. That's almost, excuse me, a third of their entire arsenal. Today they have 50 to 60,000 rockets. So you can imagine that if there's to be a future conflict, another war, God bless you, between Israel and Hezbollah, you can imagine the type of numbers of rockets that would be fired into Israel. But that's only the quantity. Let's take a look at the quality. So if back in 2006, Hezbollah had rockets that were only able to infiltrate and penetrate Israel about 20, 25 miles to, let's say, the main port city of Haifa, but not really further south. Couldn't hit Tel Aviv. Definitely couldn't hit Jerusalem. And forget about trying to hit Dimona, the home of Israel's nuclear reactor, all the way down in the Negev Desert in the south. Today they have missiles and rockets such as the M600. The M600 is a clone of an Iranian missile called the Fatah 110. It's designed in Iran, but it's manufactured, up until now at least, inside Syria. Hezbollah is believed, according to Israeli intelligence, to have several hundred of these rockets. They have a 250-mile range. But not only do they have that superior range, so now they can almost cover all of Israel, which they couldn't do just six, seven years ago. But what that also enables them to do is, right, when you have short-range rockets, you have to deploy them close to the border. So your war, like the one in 2006, was fought mostly in southern Lebanon to prevent and quell the rocket fire. But if I can deploy my rockets anywhere throughout Lebanon, because I can hit anywhere from within Lebanon, anywhere within Israel, what that means is quite obvious, is that a future war between Israel and Lebanon would be throughout all of Lebanon, because Hezbollah now can deploy its rockets throughout all of Lebanon. And we can understand, then we can, the next step is the type of devastation that that would cause to not just one part of a country, but the entire country itself. And that's the enemy depth. That means that they can deploy them deep inside their country. The fourth change that's taken place is that they fortified the rockets. They now deploy them in underground missile silos. They've built bunkers to store their rockets, which means much more difficult to detect, much more difficult to preemptive, for preemptive strikes and to destroy them before they can fire. The fifth change is the accuracy, right? If before, in 2006, those 4,000 rockets are what we like to call stupid weapons or stupid munitions, because basically what you do is you take a launcher, you lean it up in a direction, you fire it, and you hope it's going to land somewhere in the general vicinity of where you've kind of pointed it. But your point is you're not able to accurately hit specific targets because they don't have any guidance systems. Today, the M600, for example, has a inertial GPS, inertial navigation system, that enables it to accurately hit targets. So if they want to take down, for example, in Tel Aviv, the defense ministry tower, or the large Israeli mall, for example, they have that capability. And lastly, the sixth change, quite dramatic, is the size of the warhead. Those Katusha rockets fired 4,000 of them in 2006. They just had about 30, 40, 50 kilograms of explosives. That can cause damage, right? Maybe create a hole here inside the roof of this building. But now they have missiles that have 500 kilos of explosives. So you can imagine the type of devastation that all of this together can cause. And this is not just, we're not finding this just by Hezbollah in Lebanon. We see this by Hamas in the Gaza Strip, which back in 2009 was only able to hit towns in southern Israel during Operation Cast Lead, but in November was already able to fire rockets 60, 70 kilometers and be able to hit Tel Aviv and already in the vicinity of Jerusalem. This is becoming a major problem. So yes, while things are quiet, that military buildup in the region 
and among Israel's adversaries is an extreme point of concern. But this brings me to the third category, which is what I call the strategic category. And right now, when you look at this strategic category, I think you find two primary problems or threats. The first is what happens if Syria's chemical weapon arsenal, which is, by the way, one of the largest in the world today, made up of mustard gas, Sirin, VX, which they've developed for decades, since the 1970s, when then it was begun with the help of Russian scientists. But let's say they start to move and proliferate some of these chemical weapons. And in Assad's twilight, he decides to hand off some of these capabilities to his friends over in Lebanon, the Hezbollah guerrillas, or one of these other al-Qaeda-like groups that today is fighting against Assad inside Syria, manages to get its hands on these chemical weapons. So today, yes, they're fighting against Assad, but once Assad's gone, who are they going to turn against? And if they have these chemical weapons and weapons of mass destruction, and just a couple days ago, two days ago, there were reports of the use of chemical weapons in Syria, this is an extreme point of concern for Israel. But I think what overshadows it all is Iran's pursuit of a nuclear weapon which continues, Iran continues today, despite the economic pressure, despite the sanctions, despite the diplomacy, despite the P5 plus one talks, and just a recent round that we saw that was held just a few weeks ago. They are continuing to enrich uranium. They've made announcements to install second, third generation centrifuges at their different plants at Natanz, which is their main enrichment plant, but also at Fordo, at the Comb facility, which is where they dug about 100 meters inside a mountain a small hall to, of, to hold centrifuges, just about 3,000, 3,500, which can spin around to enrich uranium, potentially needed for a nuclear weapon. And I think that when you look at Obama, President Obama's visit to Jerusalem yesterday, today, tomorrow, he's still in Israel, and then he flies off, I think, to Jordan. This is the crux, really, of what this visit is about. On the one hand, I think, if you look at it, the visit is kind of twofold. On the one hand, yes, there's a lot of coordination that goes on. There's no question that Israel and the United States are the closest of allies. And there's a lot of intelligence cooperation. There's a lot of military cooperation. Just today, Israel, the U.S., and the Greek Navy wrapped up about a week-long naval maneuvers that they were holding in the Mediterranean Sea. So there's a lot of that cooperation that goes on. And that needs to be maintained. That needs to be facilitated. That needs to be taken care of and pushed forward. But I think that the second purpose of his visit, and probably this is the more important element of it, is to give the Israelis a sense of security. And as President Obama even said yesterday in his speech, in a press conference with uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, we have your back. Those were his words. In the sense that I think what he came to Jerusalem to do is to tell the Israelis that America stands behind you, America stands with you, do not take unilateral action right now against Iran. Do not take preemptive action potentially against Syria. Coordinate with us. We are here to work with you. And I think that if you understand the Israeli psyche to some extent, and this is something that I find that here in the United States a lot of people tend to overlook. And I'll take a step back for a moment, and I, I'm not, nothing of a historian, but just a quick review for one moment. If you think about it, Israel was established in 1948, almost 65 years ago, right? Since then, we fought the War of Independence in 48. There was the War of Attrition in 56, the Six Day War in 67, the Yom Kippur War in 73, the First Lebanon War in 82, the, second intif the First Intifada in the late 80s. Then there was the Second Intifada in 2000. Then there was the 2006 Second Lebanon War. Then there had been these large operations inside the Gaza Strip. Practically every decade, at least one or two wars or large operations. The threats are only increasing today. Now you have an, a, a country such as Iran, which says, which is developing nuclear weapons and openly declares, we want to destroy the state of Israel and wipe it off the map. So if you look at Israel and then you say, now, but now Israelis make concessions for peace, right? So Israel will tell you, these Israelis will say to you, but what do you mean? In 2000, right, we had that security zone I mentioned before in Lebanon. We pulled out and what happened? Six years later, we got the second Lebanon war. 4,000 rockets pounded our cities, 43 civilians killed, 122 soldiers killed. That's security? Then say to Israelis, no, but pull out of the West Bank, pull out of the Gaza Strip. So Israelis will tell you, but what do you mean? In 2005, we pulled out of the Gaza Strip, right? 
down to the last inch. And what did we get in return? Hamas rockets now are being fired into Tel Aviv. So now go and explain to Israelis, and I'm not voicing a political opinion here at all. I'm trying to explain to you what the type of Israeli thinking is, and we could talk about what I might think later. But now go and try and convince your average Israeli, you know what? Another withdrawal is in your interest. They might laugh at you because they'll say, look at our record and look at how it's been answered. So I think when, when you understand that type of mentality and then you look at President Obama coming to Israel and saying, we have your back, that is, I think, aimed at trying to ins explain and instill within is the Israelis this sense that they really do have security. But let's look, take a closer look at Iran, which is really, I think, Israel's primary threat, often referred to as an existential threat for the state of Israel. Iran already has over six tons of LEU, of low-enriched uranium, which if enriched to higher levels, that's uranium that's enriched about 3.5%. Weapons-grade uranium needs to be enriched to 90% and higher in order for it to be used for a nuclear weapon. Right? A nuclear weapon requires two basic components. You have to have your fissionable material, so that's either enriched uranium or refined plutonium, and then you need to have your weapon system, kind of how do I get all that to explode. And then if you want to install it on a missile, you also have to then have your warhead, which combines all of that together, much more complicated step farther down the road. But they already have six tons of low enriched uranium. If they were to spin that again through the centrifuges that turn up the dial and increase the enrichment level, that's enough potentially for four to five nuclear weapons. That's a large stockpile. They also have today about 150 kilograms of uranium that's been enriched 20%. Now, why are they enriching uranium to 20%? So they make up this excuse that they require fuel for, their, for the TRR, the Tehran Research Reactor, which was a reactor that was built in Tehran back in the 1960s, 70s, before the downfall of the Shah and the rise of Khomeini and the Islamic Republic of Iran. But you don't need that type of quantity. They don't need so much 20% enriched uranium, which raises a lot of questions. What's the real purpose? And the Israelis and the Americans and the Europeans all today understand that what the Iranians are trying to do is very slowly bridge the gap between the 3.5% and the 90%, so enrich uranium to some extent to 20%, and then one day when I decide to go to what's called the breakout stage, I'm sorry for getting technical here, but to go to the breakout stage and enrich uranium to higher levels, to military levels, I shorten the distance. So my time frame, my timeline is much shorter, and I can do it much quicker. Now, there's a lot of talk about the timeline for Israel, and for the United States? What are the red lines that Israel has set when it says we cannot wait any longer and we will launch a unilateral preemptive military strike against Iran's nuclear reactors? And what the red line that the United States has set down? Now keep in the back of your minds that there's only one country in the world today that has destroyed not one but two nuclear reactors. That country is Israel. 1981, the Osirak reactor outside of Baghdad being built by Saddam Hussein was destroyed by the Israeli Air Force. And in 2007, in September of 2007, again, the Israeli Air Force infiltrated northwest Syria and destroyed a nuclear reactor that Bashar al-Assad was building along the Euphrates River. No other country has done that anywhere in the world. So when you ask and you think about Israel's readiness, Israel's motivation, is Israel prepared to do things like this, well, that should kind of serve as the background and, and, and what we, how we should look at this potential threat. But if you look a little closer, I think that you see that Israel's red line, and Prime Minister Netanyahu has made this quite clear, is that Israel will not allow for the Iranians to reach the stage where they will have sufficient quantity, an SQ, a sufficient quantity of uranium enriched to 20% that would suffice for one nuclear weapon. That would be 240 kilograms. Today I said they have about 150. The, just until recently they actually had more, closer to 200. But with the pressure mounting, what they decide to do is convert some of that 20% uranium into fuel rods. So now the quantity has dropped, and this way the pressure has kind of eased on the Iranians. But Israel said 240 kilograms, that's our red line. President Obama has made very clear that the red line for the United States is we will not the, allow the Iranians to obtain a nuclear weapon, which means that even once they obtain that 240 kilograms of uranium enriched to 20%, there's still time until they actually get the weapon. Which means that if you look a little closer, the real difference between Israel and the United States, and there aren't many differences, there's not a lot of daylight. But the key difference is 
Israel saying we cannot allow them to become a nuclear th a threshold nuclear country, a nuclear capable country, which means that they have it all, they just got to make the decision. The United States says let them let them have it all. <coughs> Excuse me, but we will stop them ever from having a nuclear weapon. Now I don't want to spend too much time on Iran, but there are two key points that I want us to keep in mind. The first one is that the way to really look at Iran, and I think put all those timelines together, is to kind of think of three trains that are leaving South Station in Boston all at the same time. But you're trying to think which one's going to reach the destination or the target first. The first one, we spoke about how much they have, how much uranium, what they're doing, the weapons they're working on, et cetera. They have delivery systems, ballistic missiles that can cover anywhere in Israel and reach already six European Union countries, which raises a lot of eyebrows. Why would the Iranians need a missile that can hit Poland or Bulgaria one day? But the, so the first question, the first train is their decision to build the bomb. They haven't made that decision yet, as far as we know. They're doing a lot of what they're doing. The, the centrifuges are spinning, but they still haven't made the decision to go and build that bomb. But that train's moving. The second train is what we call the immunity zone in Israel. When will it, will the point come that they've fortified their facilities, they've put everything underground that an Israeli strike would no longer be effective. That train's also moving. And the third train that's moving is the possibility for regime change that we can all hope will one day happen in Iran. And I think, you know, I have a lot of disagreements with, with Nicholas Kristof and the articles that he writes, for example, in the New York Times. But one thing that he does very clearly and very interestingly, and he did a series on a trip to Iran about a year ago, is that the Iranian people really do love the United States. And you see that, especially this is a country where I think 70% of the people are under the age of 30, a very, very young population. Huge percentage of people, like all of you, with college degrees, but there because of the economic situation, and I guess maybe here too to some extent, find it very difficult nowadays to get jobs. But these are people who have a very strong relationship a very strong affinity with the United States for years. Let's not forget that until 1979, when there was the Islamic Revolution, Israel had an embassy in Tehran. The Jewish people and the Persian people have shared a very long and rich past in cultural and religious history together. Do you know where the second largest Jewish population is outside of Israel in the Middle East? It's in Iran. As strange as that might sound, there's about 25,000 Jews who live inside Iran today. Practice, worship, go to synagogues, have Jewish day schools, can get kosher meat. Right? Sounds very strange with all that rhetoric against Israel today. But there's that, there's that joint history, those shared values. And I think that what we saw in 2009 with the rigged elections that President Ahmadinejad stole away from Musavi, his, his, his adversary, and you saw the, the rise of the green movement and the people of Iran taking to the streets to fight back and try to bring down this totalitarian regime was a sign that there is this opposition in Iran. And one day, hopefully, that will happen. But what I always say is what's telling is that while we see the so-called Arab Spring, right, the upheaval throughout the region, the leaders of Tunisia, of Libya, of Egypt, all gone, Assad still wavering in Syria, the king of Jordan facing opposition and demonstrations on the streets of Amman, and other of these leaders in the Gulf states all kind of nervous with what will happen by them. In Iran, things are awfully quiet. So can we wait for that regime change to take place and say, you know what, let them have nuclear weapons? Because one day there will be a regime that will be friendly with Israel and with the West. I don't know that which of those trains is moving faster. And the second point is the key question which a lot of people ask often. But can Israel do it? If it comes down to it, does Israel have the ability to actually independently launch a unilateral strike against Iran's nuclear facilities, destroy them to the extent, set back Iran's nuclear program, prevent them from obtaining a nuclear weapon? And here you'll find many different answers. But I think you have to ask three key questions here. How would Israel attack Iran? Well, there are two ways. One. Israel has a fleet of F-15s and F-16s, attack aircraft, that have the ability, they have a combat radius that encompasses Iran. They could fly there, drop their munitions, fly back, hopefully cause enough damage. 
The second possibility is to use long-range ballistic missiles, which Israel is reported to have, although they've never been used in war before. The second question you have to ask is, okay, let's say my F-15s and F-16s are sent to Boucher, to, to Natanz, to Parchin, to Iraq, to Isfahan, all these different nuclear facilities. Can I penetrate Iran's air defense systems? They've s s uh, solidified, bolstered, increased their systems that they have deployed throughout the country ahead of a possible Israeli or American strike, buying up Russia's most advanced systems that they have to offer. Would Israel be able to penetrate those and overcome them? And then the third question you have to ask is, okay, so let's say I flew my aircraft, I got through the Iranian air defense systems, can I penetrate their facilities? So Natanz, for example, which is the main enrichment facility where those centrifuges are spinning as we speak, is buried about 25 meters underground with the ceiling of combined steel and concrete, wood Israeli munitions, bunker buster missiles, whatever they might be, be able to penetrate. What would happen in Fordo, which I mentioned before, which is inside a mountain and has about 100 meters, right? let's say over 100 yards of just mountaintop on top of it. Could Israel get in there? And these are the questions that Israeli military planners have to deal with and have been dealing with over the years. But I can tell you the answer that I hear from them. And that is that Israel has the ability, the ability to set back Iran's nuclear program, not to take out all the facilities, not to completely eradicate, demolish, destroy, but to cause enough damage that would delay the Iranians' progress, would set them back a year, two, or three. So is it all worth it? The retaliation that Israel would face? I don't know. But I can tell you that when Israelis look at Iran and think of it and perceive it as a potential existential threat, it's important to understand why. And this is, I think, the key to understanding what's, what's really at, at the heart of this Iranian threat. Many of us tend to look at Iran and say, you know, the moment they get that nuclear weapon, they're going to install it on one of their Shahab or Sajil or Simorg long-range ballistic missiles, fire it off into downtown Tel Aviv, and destroy the Jewish state, right? That's kind of the, the picture we have in our heads. But more realistically speaking, they would not do that because they know what would happen. Israel's purported to have a significant nuclear arsenal. Israel has very, very advanced capabilities. And Israel could retaliate. That's the less realistic scenario, although it's a threat that does exist and would exist if that were to happen. But when you think of Iran as an existential threat, you have to combine several elements together. So there's that possibility. But what's even more concerning is let's say they hand off a bomb in a suitcase, some fissionable material, a dirty bomb to one of their proxies in the region. All these weapons that I spoke about in Hezbollah's hands, in Hamas' hands in Gaza, where are they coming from? The Iranians. Which is the only country in the world today still helping Assad? Iran. What would prevent them, the largest, great state, the largest state sponsor of terrorism, with proxies throughout the region, what would prevent them from handing off some fissionable material, a dirty bomb or a device to one of these proxies? This way you have deniability. You could say it wasn't me. Let them do the, do the damage that needs to be done. Let, let them carry out that attack. The third element of it, and I think that this is the most concerning, is the nuclear arms race that this would set off. This would spell the end of the NPT, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, with the, which the Iranians are a signatory of. And this would let other countries throughout within the Middle East set off on their own nuclear arms race. And other countries have already said that they would. The Saudis, for example, right, they're a Sunni country. Shiite are in Iran, Iran, and you're familiar with the Sunni-Shia divide? It's very briefly dates back to the death of the Prophet Muhammad, who was a worthy, who could succeed him. So the Shia said you have to be a direct descendant. The Sunni said any worthy uh, man of, of, of the Islamic faith, a Muslim man. And then what was once just a religious disagreement is now a bloody, bloody battle. But the Saudis, who are even possibly more concerned about an Iranian nuclear weapon, have already said the day after we'll have one. The Turks, Turkey has already said that they're going to start building nuclear reactors. Egypt, which views itself as a regional superpower, will probably not stand by idly as the Iranians go nuclear. And you can imagine an already volatile region, which if anything that this Arab Spring has told us, you can't count on these leaders to stay in power for so long. Imagine if they already had nuclear weapons. What type of region would be facing? Something much more of a nightmare. And I think that all of this together is what makes President Obama's trip to Israel so important today. 
with this upheaval going on throughout the region, with these threats that Israel's facing, this coordination is all the more important. Ultimately, Israel's work is really set out for it. After 65 years, Israel has yet to reach the stage where it can just lay down its weapons and say, we have peace, everything will be okay. But I think that when you look at Israel, and this is something that's always taken me and, and, and amazed me to some extent, as someone who moved to Israel 20 years ago, I became an Israeli citizen, I served in the Israeli military, but it's, the, it's you know, you're probably familiar with the word chutzpah, you know, but I think it, it also means to some it's like audacity or, you know, but it, 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 to me, it's always been this sense of resilience that Israelis have, which, which you really feel just walking down the street sometimes after a suicide attack on down one street, you'll see the next day the coffee shops will still be full. It's that idea that life needs to move forward. And I think that for Israelis, despite these threats, and these are huge, daunting challenges, life does go on, life does continue. Thank you very much. If you look at Israel's national defense doctrine, right, kind of what was, what has served as pretext for war, what, what, what was the justification to go to battle, it's never been the buildup of conventional arms. But yes, it has been the obtainment or acquiring of West's weapons of mass destruction. This hasn't changed in, in, in the past few years. Israel has, so that's been the case with nuclear weapons. So that's why Israel in 81 destroyed the Iraqi reactor, 2007 destroyed Syria's reactor, and that's why there's all this talk about Iran's reactor. This strike recently in Syria was interesting because it speaks of possibly a shift in that strategy, is that even conventional arms or certain types of conventional weapons that can impair Israel's operational freedom those have also become weapons that Israel would not allow to be moved into the hands of non-state actors like Hezbollah. Now, to understand the dilemma, you see, you have to, when you face a state actor like Syria, like Egypt, which you have peace with her, like Lebanon, it's, very e it's much easier to deter a state actor. They have a power base, they have key infrastructure, facilities, there are ways to weaken them. But you're fighting against a non-state actor how do you deter them? What do you take out? If you bomb a bridge in Lebanon or you destroy the Lebanese parliament, does that impact Hezbollah? No. Hezbollah doesn't need the Lebanese parliament. Right? Hezbollah is not dependent on that. When you go into Hamat, into Gaza, and if you were to destroy the electricity grid in the Gaza Strip, for example, which Israel hasn't done in its operations, that doesn't impact Hamas. It's very difficult to, to, to deal those types of blows to these terrorist groups. But if these terrorist groups do get their hands on these types of weapons, Israel, which would need to fly over Lebanon in a future war, its, its operational freedom would be impaired. So I think that that's very interesting, and you've picked up on something that's, that's, that's quite fascinating, is that there's this shift now in, in where Israel draws that red line. And, and I wonder where, it, where it's headed. Is, is that the end of it, or are we gonna see it continue? But what's also interesting is, as you point out, is that if they already have 60,000 rockets, then, you know, they're not, they're not stopping those. Although then that raises a separate question. You can't pick up on each one of them, right? You're not going to bomb every truck. You're not going to know of every ship or every plane that's coming into Lebanon with weapons. So you might not have the ability always to take out those shipments as they're coming. What the Iranians did, if you look at the two other, sorry, reactors that Israel destroyed, the Osirak reactor in 81, the, uh, the Syrian reactor in 2007, these were single structures, right? One building above ground, right? So, you know, you just fly over, you drop your bombs, you're done, you fly back home. The Iranians have learned these lessons, right? They saw what happened to Iraq, they saw what happened to Syria. So what they did was they took their facilities, they scattered them. That's the number one lesson that they learned. Don't put, every, don't put everything in one place, not all your eggs in one basket. Then what they did is they put some of them underground. They said, look, above ground, they're vulnerable. Let's dig bunkers, put everything underground. Let's fortify those bunkers. And this way, it'll be much more difficult to penetrate. So Israel, I think, does have the ability, and it's been described to me as something like of a bridge loan, that they're able to hit them hard enough to set them back maybe a year or two, but then they would be able to rebuild everything. 
And that's the key thing that we need to understand, is that the Iranians already have the technology. They have the know-how. You can't destroy what's in someone's head, right? You can destroy the physical facility. But they, if they want, they can just rebuild it. Which means that we, we always have to ask yourself, and this is the question I always pose to people when talking about this issue, is, so what happens the day after? So let's say Israel goes at it alone against Iran. But what, do I, what ensures for me that they won't rebuild it? That there will be enough diplomatic, political pressure, international pressure. That there will be enough of a continued sanctions. That there will be follow-up strikes if needed. Right? Because let's say they start to rebuild. You'll need to go back in there again. And I think that this is what's really behind Israel's thinking. Is you could have said, why didn't Israel attack Iran years ago? We've been hearing about this for years, right? This isn't a new threat. I personally am guilty of saying almost every year of the past five, six years, this is the critical year for Iran. Well, I was wrong. But I was hearing this from the Prime Minister of Israel who said this is the critical year of Iran. And that's every year for at least the past five, six years. So why didn't Israel already do? And I think that this is, this is, this is the key. Is what Israel's main strategy has been is we, will, we want to play ball with the West. We don't want to undermine efforts. We want to take a back seat. The world says this is a threat. America says this is a, this is a threat to the world. There are sanctions being imposed by the United Nations Security Council, also independently by other countries. Let them lead the effort. We're going to play ball with that. We're not going to undermine those efforts. That's Israel's thinking. But then the idea is, is that when the day comes that we will have no choice but to act, then you will have to support us. And then this way we will, Israel will have the legitimacy. I think that's been the thinking in Jerusalem all these years. And potentially that's, that's what we're headed towards if they don't stop. And this way Israel will be able to say to its allies, look, we waited. We waited as long as we could. And now you can't condemn us. Not only can you not condemn us, you have to give us that freedom to continue to strike. You have to do that follow-up the day after. You have to keep the pressure on the Iranians. Right? So that's going to be something, that's part of this larger kind of diplomatic campaign that's needed to stop the Iranians. It's not just enough. You're not, you don't just go in there, bomb them, and walk away. It's not, that, that doesn't end it. Not at all. Sorry, the question was, does Israel consider that its purported arsenal of nuclear weapons is what is the uh, pretext, let's say, or the justification for other countries to pursue their own nuclear weapons? First of all, um, like you, I don't know for a fact that Israel has nuclear weapons, although you can Google and read all about them online. But it, what's interesting is Israel maintains what's known as what's called the policy of ambiguity, right? It doesn't admit to having nuclear weapons. It doesn't deny that it has them either. It's very ambiguous about it. And this was all, this was done as an understanding to not be the first to introduce nuclear weapons into the region in order to not start potentially that nuclear arms race. And I don't know that what, they, what, what the other side thinks they know, they might really not know, or they might not know what they think they know, right? if that makes any sense. But that ambiguity does serve some sort of purpose still today. With regards to the arms race and the possibility that they will continue, that other countries are being provoked or uh, their decision to develop nuclear weapons is because of Israel's arsenal. So I ask you a very simple question. Why have the Egyptians never developed a nuclear weapon? Only until 1979, only in 1979 did we have peace with Egypt. In 1973, there, Egypt invaded Israel in what was known as the Yom Kippur War. On, Israel, on the Jewish holiest of holy days, they invaded Israel, right? Israel already had, apparently, nuclear weapons back in 1973. Why didn't Syria develop them back then, too? Syria also invaded Israel. Why didn't Jordan? We only made peace with Jordan in 1993, right? Why, isn't, why didn't Lebanon? Iraq, which developed a nuclear uh, reactor and was trying to get nuclear weapons, was largely because of the Iran-Iraq war, right, which they fought for eight years. But I think that what you understand, and my takeaway has always been, is that although Israel has, the, has had these enemies in the region and thankfully has been able to make peace with Egypt and Jordan, it was they understood that Israel's capability, its arsenal, was not for offensive purposes. It was for defensive purposes. And when you think to what Israel, what prompted Israel to begin a nuclear program, well, if you go back, Israel was established in 1948 on the heels of the Holocaust. And Israel's founding father, David Ben-Gurion, understood that it needs to have something of an insurance policy that can prevent that from ever happening again. That was kind of what prompted them to move forward with this. 
But all these other countries understood that Israel wasn't there to dominate the region. Israel wasn't there to destroy other countries. But what's interesting is that the Iranians are completely the opposite, is that what Iran is doing with its development of a nuclear program is now kind of getting all these other countries to begin to develop nuclear programs or to start to think about it. Or even to have the Saudis, who openly admit, I've heard them. There was a, guy, there was a senior advisor to the king who came by at the Kennedy School in Harvard just a few months ago who said the moment they get nuclear, they, they, they get a nuclear weapon, we'll have one the next day. Now, how will they do that? A lot of different theories, but the Saudis are believed to have financed and funded Pakistan's nuclear program. So there's the possibility that Pakistan would just give them a nuclear device. But I think that that's, you know, when you think of Iran, and which holds conferences in Tehran University, right, a, a place of higher education like Holy Cross, you would think to some extent, where the president of Iran speaks with banners behind him that says wipe Israel off the map in five or six different languages, including English, Farsi, and Hebrew. And they're developing such a capability, that's a different, that's someone who has offensive intentions, not defensive intentions. I was trying to get at this before when discussing what, what makes Iran this existential threat, is I don't think that Iran's ultimate goal right now is that the moment they get the nuclear weapon, they're going to attack Israel. What they really want is they want to become a superpower. They want to be taken seriously. They want to be able to deter possible foreign intervention. They see the two wars that this country has fought in the region, Iraq and Afghanistan. And they were also, if you, if you, you know, strangely enough, you think back, Israel has argued for years that, yes, economic sanctions are important, diplomacy is important, all that's good. But you need to have a credible military threat on the table. And Israel's defense minister now, this guy Moshe Yaalon, who was a former chief of staff, who I've spent, had the opportunity to spend hours with and actually is one of the stars in, in, in my book, and we interviewed him at length, speaks about this credible military threat, and he refers back to 2003. Because when, it, when the United States began to build up its military presence in the Gulf ahead of the invasion of Iraq, the Iranians did something very surprising. They suspended, suspended all of their nuclear activity. They stopped enriching uranium. They stopped building, uh, working on their weapons program. And the, 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 the National Intelligence Estimate, the NIE, that came out here in December of 2007, said, admitted, agreed with that Israeli assessment, is that all of that was true. The difference then between Israel and the United States was whether they had restarted the weapons program. Israel said yes, America said no, they're just enriching uranium. But the point is, is that in 2003, they saw this massive buildup in the region, they thought that they might be next. Remember President Bush's speech, right? The axes of evil. Iran was on that list. So they thought they would be next, and that, that scared them. So when there was a real threat to their survival, when they thought that they might be next, ultimately, there's a rational thinking there that kicked in and got them to change their course of action. Today, they don't feel that credible threat. They don't see that there is a real possibility that someone will come and attack them. And I think that that's why they haven't changed their current course of action. So I think that that's clearly very, very important. But I think that the Iranians ultimately are out for deterrence. They want to boost their standing. They want to prevent foreign intervention. But I think we can't ignore that one of the basic tenets, one of the main principles of the Islamic revolution started by Ayatollah Khomeini with his return from France to Iran and the establishment of the Islamic Republic in 79 was that they want to also spread the revolution throughout the region. And they look at Lebanon, where Hezbollah is no longer just a small-time terrorist group, but has a clear political presence in parliament, in government. They look to some extent to Hamas, which is, yes, Sunni, not Shia, but they look at them also to be something of an ally. They see the, you know, the rise of the Muslim Brotherhood throughout the region in Egypt and Tunisia and Libya. So they also say to themselves, this is partially part of their main goal, is to spread that throughout the region, to undermine these more moderate leaders in the region, like King Abdullah in Jordan, like the Emir of Qatar, like the King of Bahrain, like the King Abdullah in Saudi Arabia, allies of the United States, allies of the West, undermine them, and having nuclear weapons will help them do that, will help them project their power and will make them invincible to some extent. So I think that that needs to be a key concern. That's also why it might not just be about Israel, but that's why we have to look at the larger picture and what this dominance, what will happen, what will be the chain reaction and effect throughout the region. Yeah. In my book, for example, 
I interviewed this uh, defense ministry official, this guy by the name of Uri Lubrani. Uri Lubrani, he's got to be now 80, maybe 82, 83. He was Israel's ambassador in Tehran until the revolution, got out before. He believes strongly in the ability to affect regime change inside Iran. What's needed, according to him, money and resources to locate and identify the right people, to give them the money, and to get them to start this revolution. That the people are ripe, it's just a matter of money and resources that need to be allocated. And he has strong, strong criticism, not just of Israel, but also of the United States, of not pursuing that path and not moving forward with that. So if you believe, if you agree with Lubrani, then what's needed is, is money, what's needed is attention in that direction. I think that largely what is always, you know, my always understanding has been is that Iran is 70 million people, right? Israel is 7 million people. So you got to be a little, you know, is, we tend to think, you know, Israel is kind of like the largest, the greatest, the strongest, and maybe Israelis have a bit of an ego and a chip on their shoulder. But what 7 million people can do with a country of 70 million people, you got to have a little humility, right? I'm not sure that Israel can really affect the change needed. And I think that the United States is somewhat concerned of doing anything in the line of undermining a, a sovereign state, particularly cons considering that that's what it did back in the 1950s when it overthrew the former uh, leader of Iran and installed the Shah as the new leader of Iran. And that's also what's created this paranoia for the Iranians to some extent, is that America's already done that. There already was that coup that the Americans led. Right? And that's why they're so scared. And, you know, th so I think America, to some extent, is, is you know, we don't want to go that route anymore. That, that we got burned with that. Right? So I, I don't think that that's where we will find the, that's how we're going to get to the promised land. With that said, I think that this is what I did see back in 2009, I think was quite inspirational. You know, think back to those images that were coming out of Iran. You saw people that was really fighting back. Now, they were brutally beaten back down. I think that you're right. I mean, you know, I, I can tell you that for Israelis and some officials that I spoke to, they were very, very upset with President Obama then. If you go back in the initial stages, this was, the elections were held in June. The initial, the, the first day or two, as these protests were moving forward, President Obama was very, very kind of subtle. He was talking about how we support this expression of democracy. We're happy for the you know, the Iranian uh, elections that move forward, the new leader should be chosen, et cetera, et cetera. But there was no support being thrown behind the Green Movement. It took a couple of days for him to come out and start to condemn the violence and the brutality. And I can tell you that there were some Israelis who, Israeli officials who said, had President Obama come out more forcefully in favor and behind and in support of this opposition, that could have changed things. And that all these people really wanted was to see that they have the backing of the strongest country in the world. And they didn't get that sense. Now, is that why we haven't seen them since? Is that, does that mean that that's why it was a failure? I, I, I don't know. But I do think that, that, you know, that they, the people of Iran need to feel that they have the support of the world behind them. I don't know that they necessarily have that feeling today. This is, this is what combines and creates this potential existential threat. Is it, I mentioned some of the criteria before, and you very accurately and correctly point out. So there's, there's the, the possibility that they will launch a nuclear weapon. There's the nuclear arms race. There's the handoff potential nuclear terrorism. And there's the impairment of Israel's operational freedom. And the possibility that one day, and, and this happened, right? Back in June of 2006, Gilad Shalit, the Israeli soldier, was abducted by Hamas. Regev and Goldwasser, the two reservists, abducted by Hezbollah in July of 2006. Imagine that happens again tomorrow, God forbid. Israel wants to retaliate and respond. And the Iranians say, whoa, if you go into Lebanon, we're going to nuke you guys. Would Israel be able to respond? Would Israel have the operational freedom it has today? I don't know. I, I think that's a big, big concern for Israel. And that kind of ties back to the question I received earlier about Israel stopping arms shipments and the transfer of weapons. Is That kind of all ties together into the sense that Israel needs to retain that operational freedom because even if the Iranians... Don't get nuclear weapons or get nuclear weapons. We still have all these other threats that we have to deal with. So we can't have our hands tied behind our back and not the ability, and this is the Israeli thinking, not to have the ability to be able to respond, retaliate, and defend itself. So that's with regards to your comment. With regards to the question, Israel today is the only country in the world 
that has a multi-layered missile defense architecture. It has the, what I mentioned before is the Iron Dome, the short range rocket system, which was fielded back in 2011, is operational, according to the Israeli Defense Forces, have a, has a success rate somewhere around the 80% or 75 or 80%. They claim that back in November it was even higher, closer to 90%. But this can intercept rockets with ranges of zero to four, well, sorry, not zero, four to 40 kilometers. Israel's now building a second, the medium range missile defense system called David Sling which is actually a joint development of an Israeli defense co company called Rafael, which actually developed Iron Dome, together with Raytheon here in the United States. David Sling is going to be able to intercept the medium pool of rockets. That's from 50 kilometers, you know, those that are above Iron Dome, up to about 200 kilometers. And was also supposed to be able to intercept cruise missiles, right? So there are ballistic missiles that fly like this, and then cruise missiles that fly straight. Different ways to intercept them. David Sling is supposed to be able to provide an answer and response to both of those threats. And Israel already has, that's supposed to be operational, excuse me, next year. There's already been a test of it recently. Israel already has Arrow 2, which is a long-range ballistic missile defense system, very similar to some extent, although different, than to your THAAD, right, your terminal high-altitude defense system, or to the Aegis, <coughs> excuse me, missile ships, that the U U.S. Navy has, which have SM-3 uh, missiles that are able to intercept rockets, although their percentage, their success has not been that great in, 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 uh, in tests. But the Arrow 2 is already fielded. There's uh, three batteries deployed throughout Israel. And Israel's working already on Arrow 3, which is supposed to be able to intercept long-range ballistic missiles. These are the ones that the Iranians have. These are the ones that are in Syria's arsenal, like Scud, Cs, and Ds that are is supposed to be even at a higher level. So we will ultimately have four layers of missile defense. Now this is, this is amazing, right? But there's no, nothing that's so bulletproof. There's nothing that, that's leak-proof. And when you're dealing with weapons of mass destruction, all you need is one to get through. At the same time, these are key systems because if you think about it for a moment, what, what has Iron Dome done for us? Right? So we had cast lead in 2009. Israel had troops on the ground taking over the entire northern Gaza Strip, cut off the south, operating all throughout Gaza. We had about 1,000 rockets fired into Israel during that three-week operation. But here, in Operation Pillar of Defense, in eight days, 90% of the rockets were intercepted. People, it minimized damage, it minimized casualties, which means that it provides the government with diplomatic maneuverability. They don't have to feel rushed into another conflict to put boots on the ground, which means that you have more leverage. You can think, you can take a second to think about what my next step should be. That's what's key about these systems. Do they provide the answer? Is your best offense a defense? I don't think so. I think you have to work on both tracks. But I think that this is especially important considering what I spoke about earlier, that military buildup in the region. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming.